living below in this whole sinful world. Hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation so where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to save me. Neighbors are kind, I love them, everyone. We get along in sweet accord. But when my soul needs manna from above, where could I go but to the Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to save me in the end. Oh, won't you tell me now? Where Life here is grand with friends I love so dear. Comfort I get from God's own word. Yet when I face the chilling hand of death, where could I go but to the Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to save me in the end. Won't you tell me now? Where could I go but to the Lord? Let's do an old Doyle Lawson and quick silver song. <laughs> Lay your burdens at the feet of Jesus. Let him bear your heavy load. He will lead you through the lonesome valley as you travel on life's road. Lay your burdens at the Savior's feet, your burdens at the feet of Jesus. Lay your burdens at His feet. Lay your burdens at the Savior's feet, your burdens at the feet of Jesus. Lay your burdens at His feet. In your sorrow and the way seems dreary, all your burdens are to bear. Read your Bible, keep in touch with Jesus, go to Him in secret prayer. Lay your burdens at the Savior's feet, your burdens at the feet of Jesus. Lay your burdens at His feet. 
Lay your burdens at the Savior's feet. Your burdens at the feet of Jesus. Lay your burdens at his feet. Trust his promises and doubt him never. He's a sure and precious friend. Let his will be gladly praise him ever. Lay your burdens at his feet. Lay your burdens at the Savior's feet. Your burdens at the feet of Jesus. Lay your burdens at his feet. Lay your burdens at the Savior's feet. Your burdens at the feet of Jesus. Lay your burdens at his feet. Lay your burdens at his feet. This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasures and my hopes are all beyond the blue. Where many Christian children have gone on before, and I can't find a home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friends like you. If heaven's not my home, oh Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door And I can't feel at home in this world anymore They're all expecting me and that's one thing I know I fixed it up with Jesus a long, long time ago I know it takes me through though I'm weak and poor And I can't feel at home in this world anymore Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, oh, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Over in glory land, there'll be no dying there. The saints are sounding victory and singing everywhere. I hear the voice of them that's gone on before And I can't feel at home in this world anymore Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you If heaven's not my home, oh Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door And I can't feel at home in this world anymore Lord, I can't feel at home in this world anymore. All right, I want to say thanks to Debbie and Johnny for singing and playing and all that good stuff. They do a great job. And um, Donnie's got that real natural bluegrassy sound, doesn't he? He's got that Doyle Lawson twang. But anyway, I appreciate them more than they will ever know. Um, turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, be finding that. Um, I was looking here at some prayer requests. Does anybody know who put this on the podium? Anybody know? Uh, Chris may have. Vicki James' uncle, Carl Garner, 88, 88 years old. He's a retired Baptist pastor. He's in the hospital with a slight heart attack and low blood pressure. So let's remember to pray for Carl Garner, if we would. All right, so don't forget that. First Thessalonians chapter 1. Years ago uh, at Grace Baptist Church in Greensboro, this would have been somewhere late 1984, early 1985, I heard Randy Hobbs, who was then and is still the pastor uh, at uh, New Hope Baptist Church in Burlington. And he preached a message from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, those 10 verses there. And he preached a message called the Almost Perfect Church. 
And it was one of the greatest messages I've ever heard. I took notes. Uh, God had just called me to preach. I was uh, on the deacon board at that church at the time. And God had called me to preach. And I became a youth director and so on and so forth. But uh, I got a chance to go to the Philippines in 1997. And when I went to the Philippines, one of the, the very first place I preached was at what they called a, a pastor slash full-time Christian workers fellowship. So there were lots of pastors there, lots of full-time Christian workers. And I preached that message on the almost perfect church. And if you were to look in this chapter, you would see at least 10 things that the, the Apostle Paul commended the church at Thessalonica for. The funny thing about that message was I preached to all these preachers from all over. And uh, then after that, I went south of Manila. Uh, we had to go by boat. And I went to a large uh, city. It was called Calapan in the region of Oriental Mindoro. And that's where I was going to be speaking uh, in several services there. So I was there like Saturday all the way through Wednesday or something like that. Uh, in a church and you know, on a college campus, all those kind of things. And then by the time we get back to the mainland, into Manila and Tarlock and all these places, we're driving that day in a minivan. I'm riding with somebody, and we're picking up preachers as we go north to a youth camp. We're picking up preachers all along the way. We must have, in a minivan, we must have picked up at least five or six preachers. <clears throat> and every preacher, <coughs> excuse me, every preacher that we picked up, Donnie, told me when they got in, they said, Pastor, we enjoyed your message very much last week. I preached it in my church on Sunday. Every one of them had preached that message. But it is a great chapter in God's Word. And I want to concentrate on just verse number 5. And, uh, and here's the verse. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. May God add his blessings and his understanding to the reading of his precious, precious word. I mentioned that Paul has commended these people for 10 different things here. And you can look those up. I may preach it again some other time. But one of the things he mentions in verse number 5 is how the gospel had come to the folks in that region. Look at it again. For our gospel came, it, it came by the word, obviously, because he says not in word only. So we know that it, the gospel came through the word of God, but also in power, that would be number two, in the Holy Ghost would be number three, and in much assurance, number four. So it's amazing that he mentions in that one verse four ways that the gospel came to them. But here's what I want to point out about this. We are praising God that the gospel had come to them. We're praising God that the gospel has come to us. But what if, what if the gospel had not come to you? What if you had not been raised in a Bible teaching, Bible preaching church? What if no one cared enough about you to share the gospel or to share Christ with you? How lost we would be. But now that someone has, I mean, everybody in this room, I believe, has the testimony that they're saved. And so... Uh, now that we believe, now that we've accepted the gospel, now that we've accepted Christ as our Savior, what do you care enough about people to share the gospel with others? Do you care enough about people? Do, do you, now that you've accepted Christ as your Savior and your Lord, what, Donnie, what if we didn't care after we were saved? What if we just got saved and said, well, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. I don't care if anybody else does or not. What if, what if, I mean, we need to have a compassion for those who are lost. If you love God, you'll share the gospel. If you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you will share the gospel. Let me give you a couple of verses. John's gospel, chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said, uh, if you love me, keep my commandments. The Greek here says, if you really have a self-sacrificial divine kind of love is that agape, a self-sacrificial divine kind of love for me, you will be in the habit of keeping my commandments. So then you turn back to Matthew 28, just before Jesus uh, would ascend back into heaven, and he says in verse 19 of Matthew 28, hey, this, is, this is a commandment, by the way. How do you know? You'll see in a minute. Go, Jesus speaking, go you therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, 
teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded, not suggested, not recommended, whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So if you love the Lord, you will be in the habit, I think, of sharing the gospel. If you love others, I think you would share the gospel as well. I cannot imagine a a Christian, somebody that's really accepted Christ as a Savior, had the love of God in the heart, the Holy Spirit of God in their heart. I cannot imagine a Christian who knows what the Bible says about those who die without Christ. I cannot imagine us, imagine us not caring enough about people to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. A recent Lifeway research study showed this. 80% of those who attend church one or more times a month believe they have the responsibility to share their faith. Now, I'm going to say that again because it's important that you hear the statistic. In a Lifeway study, 80% of, of believers who attend church at least once or more a month, they believe that they have a responsibility to share their faith. But out of those 80%, only 60, excuse me, 61% of those had not told another person about Christ in the last six months. So they feel like they got a responsibility, but they just don't do it. It, it amazes me. It just amazes me. We ought to have a compassion for lost souls. We used to sing a song here, Jason, in the traditional choir years ago. Uh, it said, win the lost at any cost. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. But we need to have a compassion for the lost. By the way, one of the excuses you hear by Christians most often as to why they don't share their faith. You, I've, I've asked people, why, why don't you share your faith? And here's the number one answer, I don't know how. I don't know how. And so tonight I would like to begin a two-part series. I'll finish it up next Wednesday since we're not having church on Sunday night. But I want to give you five simple steps how... You can share your faith. And I said simple. Uh, sometimes simplicity is the best way. And so we're going to look at some things. Now, remember this. It's an old saying I heard years ago. But sharing your faith can be as simple as one beggar telling another beggar where there's food. And that's pretty easy, right? It's as simple as one beggar telling another beggar where there's food. Now, using 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5 as our springboard, I'm going to go to several passages and try to get through just a couple of these tonight since I've had a rather lengthy introduction. But uh, first of all, if you take notes, and I appreciate so much you folks who watch on Facebook and YouTube, but if you take notes, uh, understand this first. Keep it clean. Keep it clean. Now, don't take that the wrong way. Psalm 51, I'm turning back there. Psalm 51, we have the, re the recording of David's prayer after he had realized his sin with Bathsheba. Now, David was a man after God's own heart. David was king of Israel, and he was God's, uh, he was God's first chosen king. If you look in the Judges, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did that that was right in their own eyes. And then you had all these judges, and then Samuel was the last of the judges, and uh, the people of Israel said, Give us a king like everybody else has a king. And uh, they wanted Saul to be their king. But Saul wasn't God's king. Saul was man's king. And then later, God anoints David as his first chosen king of Israel. So you had no king, man's king, and then God's king. But David became God's king. But David was still a man. He was made of clay. And he was still subject to like passions, as Elijah would say in the book of James, as it records Elijah saying. So, uh, or James saying, we're a man of like passions. So he had his problems. He had his difficulty. And boy, he really got into a mess because you, you read in the, in the, in the scriptures, in the Kings, where, where David had, uh, he had uh, sent all, it was a time when kings go to war, but David stayed back. He should have been with his men, but he stayed back. And he was up there on that lofty perch of his. Uh, we, some of us have been blessed to go to Jerusalem, and you can just picture as he looked down, as you look south into the old city of Jerusalem, it, go, it descends. And he was up on a high place, and he could look down uh, inside the properties of other people. And he saw Bathsheba, uh, Bathsheba bathing. And you know the story. He looked after her. He lusted after her. He longed for her. He brought her in and he lay with her, committed adultery. And then when she became pregnant, uh, he has her husband. He finds out he has her husband. 
Uriah, one of his, uh, one of his military men, uh, I believe one of his generals, and he has his group come in and he tries to get him to lay with her. And of course, he's a noble man. He will, he's not going to do that when the other men are uh, all out there, you know, outside and they can't do that. And then he tries to get him drunk and he still won't do it. But after all this, God sends Nathan the prophet. And Nathan the prophet, after a lengthy story about what David has done, David not knowing that he's the man, Nathan the prophet sticks his scrawny little finger in the king's face and says, Thou art the man. And David prays this prayer right after that in Psalm 51. And it starts off in the, the epitome of humility. He is weeping. He's the king of Israel. But he's broken and he's weeping. And he says, Oh God, have mercy upon me according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercy. Blot out my transgression. And if you'll study this passage, he, he is the epitome of humility to start with. But after he deals with the sin, he begins to get a little more and a little more confident. Notice a couple of things. I'm saying keep it clean. And I'm speaking about the fact that God cannot use a dirty vessel. If you want to share the gospel, God cannot use a dirty vessel. Matter of fact, Isaiah 52, 11 says, Depart ye, depart ye, go you out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go you out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. And then notice in Psalm 51, how many times David asked God for some type of cleansing. In verse number one, he says, blot out my transgression. That word blot pictures wiping something completely clean. No residue left behind. It's all about being free of, of, of sin and free of the hint of sin and free of the memory of sin. I used to love to give this illustration. In my day, I'm 62 years old, and in my day, we had chalkboards in school. Did y'all have chalkboards? Now, you're too young, Debbie. Donnie, yeah, y'all had chalkboards. Sometimes, if, you what? You just use rocks. You're you really old. <laughs> but, and charcoal, right? But... Uh, we had chalkboards, and if you were bad, sometimes you had to stay after class and not only dust the chalkboard off, you know, dust everything, erase everything, you had to take a wet cloth because that dust was still there, and you had to wipe that residue off so that the chalkboard was theoretically completely clean. Well, when God cleanses us from our sin, it is a complete cleansing. And uh, we stand before God righteous, amen? So he, said, he asked for a cleansing, blot out my transgression. Uh, secondly, he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now, in that one verse, you get two requests for cleansing, wash me and cleanse me. And notice also as I'm reading these, the different words that David uses for sin, transgressions, uh, iniquities and sin and, uh, and, and, and there's others, there's evil and iniquity and all the, and, and I say that to say this, David don't play around when he's talking about his own sin. He, he doesn't, he doesn't try to clean it up or cover it up or color it up. He calls sin just what it is. You know, these days uh, we're in a society where if, if you say anything derogatory, it's not politically correct. Now, now in my day, back, back in the chalkboard days, we had, if people had a, an alcohol problem, they were drunks. And, and now they had, then it was alcoholics, and now it's chemical dependent. Uh, and so it gets a little easier every time, a little bit less, you know, uh, degrading or whatever you want to call that. But uh, David called it what, what transgressions, uh, sin, iniquity. Then he says in verse 3, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. This purge me with hyssop pictures the Levitical cleansing in the days of the Old Testament where uh, a person would bring a sacrificial lamb to the priest. He would observe it. He would check and make sure that it was, it was without spot, without blemish. And then he would, he would kill that lamb. He would cut his throat. He would drain the blood uh, in a basin right there at the altar of incense. And he would take a hyssop branch. It's a, it's a branch. You can see them growing all over Israel, growing out of the rocks and everywhere else. And, uh, and he would take a hyssop branch and he would dip that hyssop branch in the blood of that sacrificial lamb and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And that's what David's talking about here. 
purge me with hyssop. It's a part of the Levitical cleansing process. Lord, if you'll do this, I'll be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. And then he says, in, uh, he says, create in me a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Uh, this is verse number 10. David asked for a clean heart. Proverbs 3, 23, 7 says this. 23, 7. For as he thinketh about a man, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so he says, O God, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Well, that's all the way through verses 10. Now, you get through all this. Look at verse 10, create in me a clean heart. Verse 11, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. We do not have to pray for that in this generation that we live in because God said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And if you're a child of God, you got the Holy Spirit inside of you. Amen. So we don't have to pray that prayer. But then he says something interesting. Verse 12, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. It's God's salvation, but he gives it to anyone who asks. Isn't that wonderful? He said, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with uh, thy free spirit. After all the sin, he says, then, when? After I've dealt with the sin. After I've been cleansed, after I've asked for forgiveness, then, I'll, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Isn't that amazing? I think if we had more Christians in this, this society that we're living in, if we had more Christians getting right with God and asking for cleansing and trying to be clean, asking God to cleanse them before he uses them, a lot of times I just say, Lord, uh, forgive me on my sin and uh, make me fit to be used and use me any way you see fit. Amen. And God will do that. But we got to be cleansed first and then God could use it. If we had more Christians getting right with God and more Christians who love God enough to share the gospel and loved others enough to share the gospel, I believe with all my heart we'd, be see, we'd see more people getting saved. I really do. So number one is keep it clean. I'm just going to do one more tonight, and that will be found in Acts chapter 8, and it's keep it simple. First we're to keep it clean, and then we are to keep it simple. I love to read about Philip in the New Testament, Acts chapter 8. If you're looking at verse number 12, it says, But when they, excuse me, but when they believed Philip, listen, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then jump way over to verse 35 where he's dealing with this Ethiopian eunuch. And then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Preached unto him Jesus. Years ago, uh, I heard a man talking to my pastor, Roger Smith, after church was over one Sunday morning. Everybody was gone except for my wife and I and Roger and one man who had been coming to church for, I don't know, three or four Sundays. And I heard him tell my preacher, he said, I'm not coming back to this church anymore. And, and Roger said, well, why not? He said, because all you do is preach Jesus. <laughs> and Roger just kind of snickered at him. He said, well, he said, the whole Bible's about Jesus. Amen. The whole Bible's about Jesus. The Old Testament is Jesus enfolded, and the New Testament is Jesus unfolded. Amen? And so that's what Philip was pre I love that. Philip opened up his mouth and began to preach Jesus. Keep it simple. The Open Study Bible in their notes say, says this. We must be able to clearly give out the simple facts of the gospel without getting bogged down with profound theological concepts. Now, as I said in my introduction, sharing the gospel should be as simple as one beggar telling another beggar where there's food. Donnie, I don't have to define eschatology, and I don't have to get into hermeneutics when I'm sharing the gospel with somebody. We don't have to know all the kings of Israel in chronological order, how long they reigned and what killed them and so on and so forth. I'm sure if we check it, we'll find out that the coronavirus killed a lot of them. You know, because that, that's getting tagged to a lot of people that died of air. You get hit by a car right now and say, yeah, the coronavirus got him because he got hit by a corona beer truck, I reckon. I don't know. But uh, I'm sure that's what happened to a lot. Of, but there are 39 kings of Israel, uh, when, you, when you count them all, uh, 39 kings. You don't have to go in naming all the kings of Israel and, uh, and put them in chronological order and all these kind of things. Just share the simple truth of the gospel. If they can realize they're a sinner, repent of their sin, receive Christ as their Lord and their Savior, they can be saved. Amen? 
because that's what the Bible says. Now, I'm going to close this first half of the message with an illustration. Talk about keeping it simple. Keeping it simple. Years ago, I was going to go to, what's the name of the city? Um, Ken Mayor, North Dakota, and preach. John Federhoff, who probably at some point will be listening to this, he was a member of this church many, many years ago, just for a short time. And God, God took him to Monroe, Louisiana. He worked for Bible Broadcast Network, and they made him a station manager there. And while there or somewhere nearby, God called him to preach, and he's pastored in several places. Well, when he got to Kenmare, North Dakota, 30 miles from the Canadian border, uh, he called me. He said, I'm going to get you up here to preach for me. And I said, please make it in the middle of July. And, uh, and so he did, because it gets cold up. I mean, it gets dang cold up there, you know. And so uh, he said, I'll get you up here in July. So uh, he called me up there. Now, uh, I was going to fly. I thought about driving, but it was like 1,800 miles, and I decided to fly up there. And I, so you fly in Delta, and if you fly Delta, you got to go through Atlanta. I, I'm, I'm, pr I'm hoping and praying that when, when the rapture takes place, God doesn't use Delta. Because if he does, everybody got to go through Atlanta, you know. But we get we get into Atlanta, and you know, you switch planes, and now we're going to go from Atlanta and fly to St. Paul, Minneapolis. And so I get in my seat. Everybody hates to see me coming. Now they say the camera adds ten pounds, and so some of you are looking nice. Say how many cameras are on you? Uh, as big as I am, you know. But but I've lost I've lost fifty some pounds. But so this is when I was quite a bit heavier. But so everybody hated to see me coming down the aisle on the airplane, and they're saying, "Lord, please don't let him be sitting with me. Please don't let him be sitting." Well, there was as I was getting to my seat, there was a, an older little bitty lady, and then this young lady. She was probably about the age my daughter Mandy and she was in the middle and sure enough there I had the next seat and I sat down beside these two ladies and once the plane got up you know took off and all this kind of stuff this young lady just a beautiful young lady she struck up a conversation with me and she said what do you do <laughs> and I said I'm a Baptist pastor uh, in a church in Greenford North Carolina and she said I'm a Catholic and I said well tell me I said tell me about your faith I would love to hear your story. We got a look. We got a couple hours here. I would love to hear your story. And she began to share with me for twenty minutes. She shared with me about the Catholic faith and all this and and you know, and all the things that they have to do. And it's really a a works based salvation. Uh, this kind of thing, you know. And you pray to the uh, you go to the Father, you know, and uh, pray to Him, and He takes your prayers and petitions to the Lord. My Bible said there's only one mediator between man and God, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. That's scripture. But anyway, I just listened to her. Very, and Jason, believe it or not, I didn't say a word other than uh-huh, uh-huh. And I listened to this young lady. And she got through, and I was satisfied that she was through. I said, and I said, is that all? She said, that's all. I said, can it be my turn now? And she said, it sure can. I said, here's what I believe. And I got to share my faith, the gospel, with that young Catholic girl. Now, I, I you know, I, I kept it simple, and I let her know. I, she said that she's a Catholic. I told her this. I said, you know what? A Catholic can be saved just as good as a Baptist can. Hallelujah. Amen. And so I shared that with her, and, and I began to share my faith with her. Of course, I had a Bible there, you know, and, and uh, I shared my faith with her, and she said, I've never heard anything like that in my life. And I said, You've never heard that Jesus died for your sins? She's, oh, yeah, I've heard that. But she said, I've never heard that you can be saved by just repenting of your sin and asking Christ to come into your heart. She said, it's more of a work-based thing in, in, our, in our religion, in, in our denomination. So and here, here's, my, here's my point. I did not share with her eschatology and hermeneutics and all the kings of Israel. I kept it simple. And she appreciated me keeping it simple. And I probably didn't talk with her but just eight or ten minutes. And she started asking me some questions, and I, and I kept my answer simple. Now, I would just like to think that somewhere down the road that I gave her just enough uh, information, just enough of the Word of God 
that it began to plant a seed and somebody else to water. The Apostle Paul says one plants the seed, another one waters it, and God gives the increase. And I'm hoping I'll see that young lady when I get to heaven. I don't know that I would remember her, but she would remember me because I'm the big fat guy that sat beside her on the airplane and she shared, uh, she shared her testimony with me. But wouldn't it be great to see her? And she said, you told me about Jesus and about how a person needs to trust Christ as their Savior. And she said, I got to looking into that and I got to study it. Wouldn't it be great? To see that young lady in heaven. You know, you don't, have to, you don't have to pound them. You don't have to embarrass them. You don't have to humiliate them or drill them. Just share the love of the gospel. Just share the love of God with them. And sometimes that's all it takes. The Kingsmen have a song that says, Go and tell somebody what the Lord can do. Go and tell somebody what he's done for you. Sometimes all it takes to lead a person is Christ. It's just sharing your own personal testimony. And then that'll spark some questions and you can answer them from the precious word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Well, that's, that's part one and two. Uh, well, the first two points of how to share your faith. Keep it clean. God will not use a dirty vessel. And keep it simple. Keep it simple. And people will hear the word of God. And praise God that many of them will be saved. Well, we're going to close with prayer tonight. And then we hope to see you again on Sunday morning, uh, Brother Chris Davis uh, doing the Facebook service. Father, we thank you so much for your word and its power. I thank you that you're still God, still on the throne, still in control of all things, Lord. And we feel like we have felt your presence in this place tonight. Praise God for that. In the music, in the fellowship, and even in the preaching of your word. I just pray you would take what's been read and what's been said tonight and magnify it in the uh, in the hearts of listeners, and Lord, through the Holy Spirit of God, help them to understand and comprehend what's been shared tonight. And Lord, I pray that someone out there listening may begin to uh, question their faith and uh, may want to call us up, Lord, and ask us more questions. It would be a thrill to us to know that somebody called and wanted to know how to be saved. Lord, I pray that you save anyone that's lost, that's hearing this message. Uh, save, Lord. Anyone and everyone who would cry out to you with a believer's repentance and a believer's faith. Lord, protect us now as we go our separate ways. Uh, help us to have a great night's rest. And help us to wake up in the morning ready to serve you just because we love you. And pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so very much, Lord willing. We'll see you on Sunday and again on next Wednesday. God bless you. Have a blessed day.